Haha, <laughs> that looks really cute. Oh, I love it! You're listening to the Mike Cassidy Photography Podcast. It's your real world photography business masterclass with no BS and no magic shortcuts. Here's your host, Mike Cassidy. And boom goes the dynamite. And boom goes the dynamite. Greetings, boys and girls. Greetings, boys and girls. My name is Michael. My name is Michael. And I'm your neighbor. I am your neighbor. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. What's going on, everybody? Actually, I've had a pretty quiet and uneventful past couple of weeks or so, and had a couple of client sessions, but everything is just like remarkably smooth sailing uh, right now. And actually, it's been quiet, maybe a little too quiet. Usually, I'm getting more like last minute inquiries for Christmas, but so far there hasn't been that surge and it's getting up to the wire here. So this is going to be interesting and I'm wondering if what's going on this year is going to affect affect, uh, Christmas business a lot or maybe it's just random variants and we'll have to see. And um, one thing I was thinking about though, and we don't talk a lot of photography gear here on this show, but I think I'm planning on buying one of the new Nikon mirrorless cameras, the Z62 or the Z72, or as most of the rest of the world pronounces it, Z62 or Z72 when they come out. I think they're coming out soon. I've been I've been putting off this for so long. Um, and when Nikon, I guess, released their first batch of mirrorless cameras, it's probably a couple of years ago. Now I was like... You know, you knew that was happening, and I was guess I was excited. I like buying new cameras every once in a while, and I wanted to get one. And then the details started coming out. And although apparently these cameras take great photos, it seems they really weren't designed for like pro photographers. And they were seeing they had just like single SD cards. And most importantly, at least at least for me, there was there was no like vertical grip, so I never I never got one just kind of using the same cameras I've had now for a while. And, uh, you know, everybody, I guess, has their sticklers. And for me, as somebody who spends like half of my time holding the camera sideways and taking portrait-oriented photos, I need I need a grip. Um, and the grip for me has another function, you know, that you really don't hear about. You see, like I have big man hands and cameras aren't necessarily always so big so adding that grip to the camera increases the size of it and makes it easier to hold for a few hours it's not like i'm holding something teeny tiny in my hands or uncomfortable and squeezing this small camera you know like to me that's that's a big deal i need a larger size body and you know mirrorless cameras tend to be smaller um you know and i need something bigger to work i think more comfortably with my hand so looks like the new z62 and z72 will have this fully functioning grip uh so that's interesting for me and then also i guess they also have second card slots now and i'm sure i could live with one i feel better having two i guess you're just used to that and i think i don't know i think maybe i've only ever had experienced one card failure um but in like situations when you're with a client or if you're like a wedding photographer, there's no do-overs, you know. So when you're there in that moment, things have got to be working. And this is an issue. You can't go back and, and, and try again. So that second s- slot really gives a bit of security and redundancy. And I always kind of like that feeling. And, you know, I know Comp CF Express and XQD cards are like fairly resilient, but it's nice. It's nice to have that second card slot. It gives me peace of mind so i think i'll be picking up one of those cameras towards the end of the year i don't even really know when they're like officially released so i'll wait see some immediate feedback and then uh i'll go grab one or the other and treat myself treat myself you know for the year and speaking of treats today's show is a treat 
In the scale of treats, it's like a giant hot fudge sundae with giant whipped cream and two cherries on top. Our guest today is Nicole Begley of Hair of the Dog. And Nicole, she's got a lot going on. What are you going to do? She's the founder of the Hair of the Dog Academy, which is an online community where she teaches pet photographers to create successful businesses. She's the author of the book, Pet and Equine Photography for Everybody, which is available on Amazon. And she also hosts the Hair of the Dog podcast, and she operates her own photography business in the Charlotte, North Carolina market. And after all that, she's exhausted. Now she's not exhausted. She's okay. And this was this was good. And you know, and even though I'm like a super genius, I don't like acting like it. I prefer to be more of like a casual doofus. But hey, you know, that's just how I am. I don't like acting smart. But when I talk to Nicole, I have to be smart because she knows what's going on. She knows the business of photography. And uh, in this show, which was fun, we cover a lot of ground, everything from getting your business off on the right foot to why you shouldn't be comparing yourself to other businesses, to learning how to create value in the things and the products that you offer. And there's there's a lot in there. And speaking of being exhausted, I was the one who was exhausted after all this stuff, but it's it's good. And how I came across her by listening to her podcast, actually, I, I found it just searching through one day and I was like, mm-hmm, uh-huh, mm-hmm, and she's, she's on the ball. She knows what she's doing. And I highly recommend listening to her podcast, which is also called Hair of the Dog. There's a lot of great business advice. Uh, and Nicole, she has this gift of clarity and she can explain things in a no-nonsense, straightforward way that a lot of people can't do. She's really smart. So if you want to learn how to grow your photography business, she's somebody you really want to listen to. So do it. Do it. Do it. You know, and as always, I like hearing from you. You can connect with me online on Instagram at Mike Cassidy Podcast or via my email, Mike at the Photography Podcast show. If you feel like reaching out to me and thanks so much and see you on the next show. This podcast and my website both focus on the goal of translating the art and business of photography and making it accessible and understandable to everyone. My goal is to provide the best content in photography for you, the listener. I've assembled a great team of photography guests and experts to make this happen. What I've chosen to do is create a subscriber model for my audience. If you value what I'm doing, you can become a member and support this podcast. In exchange, you'll get benefits over and above what's available for free. It's my goal to ensure that subscribers will definitely get back more than they give. I've created a membership program that brings you far more in-depth content if you want to take your knowledge of photography to the next level. Members will receive episodes with complete, unabridged interviews with our guests, Members will also get exclusive access to listen to and participate in AMA episodes. And there's more. If you would like to learn more now, head over to the photography podcast dot show forward slash subscribe. Now, without further delay, here's today's episode. The one thing I'm, I'm really, though, excited to talk to you because I guess I randomly came across your show, maybe even a couple months ago, and you remind me a lot of like me in the sense that when I listen to your show, it's like no nonsense. Yeah. You know, you're like, that's not going to work. You got to do it like this, this, this. There's no like, oh, well, maybe, you know. And I was like, yeah, you tell them that's not going <laughs> to You can't have a bad website and you can't do this. And you can't. You know, you're like very definitive on yeah. these things. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't do. They want to be like, please, again, to everybody, they want to please everybody that's like listening to their to their shows. And it's not like, yeah, no, you can't do this. And, right. you know, and the one thing that's very weird about, and I've talked to this before about, you know, there's so many people out there teaching 
and uh, educating about photography. And there's so many that just don't, you can listen and you just know that they really don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, right. They just don't have the experience. And then when you do come across somebody, you're like, wow. And you stop and you, and you want to, and you want to listen. So that was like your show. Oh, was, yay. I, uh, Thanks. You know, I'm like, listening listen to your episodes so yeah everybody needs to 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 know about that yeah thanks and um, get on there and and listen to that so it's it's definitely great and you're like really like one of the smartest photography content producers i think out there Aww. in terms of what you're well bringing. thank you just like all this gushing is going on <laughs> very unlike me it must thanks. be all that that caffeine all that caffeine that going to your and, head <laughs> ooh, it's all now the crash comes and it's all like <laughs> It's all down. Uh, I'll yell if you if your head drops right. on your keyboard. I'll wake it up. That's right. You could you could take over. Just do your own show. Just keep on going. If I if I uh, drop out and um, well, first of all, you can introduce yourself today. Okay. I'm talking yep. to, to Nicole. So go ahead and I'll keep the armor and you can step in, Nicole, and tell everybody who you are and, and what you do. Hey, everybody. Nicole from Nicole Bagley Photography and Hair of the Dog here. I'm so excited to be here on this podcast today. Thanks, Mike, for having me. Um, gosh, my background. Let's see. I used to be a zoological animal trainer for 13 years after college and um, worked my way up to kind of basically essentially middle management and um, didn't love my job as much as I used to. Still love the animals, still love my team. But sometimes it's challenging when you're not really don't can't make all the decisions, but have to live by many decisions. Um, so anyway, I was looking for something to do because I always had this entrepreneurial spirit. I loved creating things um, and thought about becoming a dog trainer because I knew animal training really well. But I knew that I did not have the um patience for the people if I went back a week later and they were like why is my dog still doing this and why did you not do your homework oh well that would be why but he should not do that so anyway I didn't have any patience for people that wouldn't do their work <laughs> so I'm like that's not gonna work so I well, actually you, you what, figured that out sooner yeah, than later exactly I knew I was like if I could take the dogs and I would totally be down and leave them, the people yeah, yeah who wants exactly. to deal with people exactly the people can be challenging sometimes um but um, but then I realized I really loved photography. I knew nothing about it other than like point my camera and press a button. Um, but I really enjoyed taking pictures of the animals that I had always worked with. And so I thought, huh, I could maybe try this whole photography thing. And that was 2009, 2010 when I got started with that. And at the time... I started doing pets on the side a little bit because I thought that would just be fun. Didn't think it could be a full-time um, genre that I would have to do families or something else too. So I also did families, um, did high school seniors for a little bit at the beginning um, because surely you can't just be a pet photographer. But that, You can't make, that can't be a living. Yeah, right. Turns out you can. It just took me about five years to make the leap to say, oh my gosh, I can really do this. I can really focus on what I absolutely love to photograph, which is animals, dogs and horses mainly. And, and here you are. Yeah. <laughs> you did it. No, and it's 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 interesting. And I bet, and because I, I know someone who, uh, used, or still does, do pets, not really like full time. And it was always like insulting because I heard, I've been with her when someone came, you know, like, that's what you do for a living. Like, right. there's this, in, un, you know, they, they can't believe that that could be like a like a job so i imagine you run into that kind of a all lot. the time getting getting uh-huh. started and you're yeah like, That's- even people that you know like family aunts uncles and whatnot they're like oh wow really that's it just that's your full-time job? Uh, yes, <laughs> sure is. Yeah, you, you, at least you talk about it. I don't even talk about what I do. I yeah. make up some job. <laughs> like I work in a bank. Yeah. Really well, that's, Nobody oh, asks about that. <laughs> that. That Michael, we're so proud of him. What does he do? Oh, he works in the bank. He works in a bank? I don't know. <laughs> that's what we just tell grandma. <laughs> little does she, little does she know. So you went on uh, years and years and years. And basically what we're going to be talking about today is you know the idea of of growing the business and what i found interesting about one of your shows um was it, it's like fascinating to me and i'm guessing in pet photography here too there are different strata and this is something we'll talk about a little bit just like in weddings or anything mm-hmm. else there's high end i guess mm-hmm. there's the middle ground and there's people who are, are, are like kind of entry level and one of the the fascinating things to me 
And this is something I just actually had to, I had a call from a woman in the beginning of June because in the summer, mostly I do women in, I mean, in the year round in the summer, I'll do, somehow I got doing some beach families. I live right by the ocean. So mm-hmm. I'll go down and I don't know how that happened, but now it's like a thing. So I get stuck with all these crying kids in the, in the summer when I can only take so much of maybe that, maybe I should be drinking something other than Pepsi. <laughs> but, you know, I will get a call from a woman and this happened in June. I just happened to be in my car at Home Depot and pick up the, the phone and she's like, yeah, we, you know, we want our family. And she goes, and all I really want is just all the photos on a CD, you know, And I'm like, well, that's not really how it works. But yet there's this ongoing thing out there and there's so many photographers. And she said, well, the last person that took Mm -hmm. our photos, that's all they did. You know, we paid them thirty five dollars and she did all this and and gave us the CD. I'm like, no, couldn't understand it. Like they cannot. Right. that, That brain cannot like understand what we charge by the photo. You know, when I'm talking to her, I'm like, well, when you go in a restaurant and you order chow mein, doesn't mean you get every other meal on the on on the menu. You got it. You know, all right, right well, we'll right. get back to you. And you know what that means. Yeah, you're never, right. You're never. And so I don't try to. It's just not the person that I'm going to be dealing with. But it was always like interesting to me that that kind of mindset is just so pervasive with a lot of people who get in and not just with pets or anything else, but in, in photography in, in general. And I'm wondering if you have any insight or the people that you work with or talk to is really where does that come from and, and how does that even exist now uh, in, in the world of, of photography? Yeah, for our like in our clients mindset of them mm. expecting all that. Or even the photographer's mindset. Yeah. Th- someone's given them the, right. th- these products like this and there's no way you can survive. Yeah, like, no, I think like. I think because I actually had this thought when I very first started, like when I was like, I'm going to become a photographer. And then um, I think it was uh, somebody sent me, oh, look here, you can do mini sessions. And it was like, look how great this is. And it was like a whole day in the park, you know, $50 a person, you get the files, you know, you've seen it a gazillion times. And I was like, huh? Oh, yeah. And then you start to do the math and you're like, okay, well, wait, 50 and I do 10, that's $500 for a day. That's more money than I'm making now. But you don't understand that you have all this work to prepare those clients, to edit those photos, to send those photos to the clients. By the time you usually add up all the time that you've worked on that particular client, you're making well less than minimum wage. Besides the fact that you still have to pay taxes on that money, you still have business expenses, you need to buy camera, you need to buy gear, you need to pay for insurance. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So thankfully, when I first started, um, I had that thought for a little bit, and then I um, thankfully seeked out, sought out, sought out some education, and I um, knew nothing about PPA or any of this online. There wasn't that mm-hmm. much online education then, right? But right. Um, no, you're right. Yeah. yeah, I did a search. I'm like, there's got to be a photography conference. So I ended up coming across Imaging, which is PPA's big right. giant conference, and I went there really as I was like just planning to start my business. And that was the best decision that I ever made because... Yeah, so you have your photography master. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, It it just, it helped me see that, oh, digital files are not profitable in in a sustainable way. So it allowed me to set my business up correctly from the get-go so that it would be sustainable. So I totally get how when you're starting out, you're like, oh, there's no cost of goods sold. Like it, it seems so shiny and easy and profitable, Mm. but until you really know how the business works, it's just not. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And and then, yeah. And the client side, you know, there's always somebody offering those types of things. So some of them were like, oh, well, I've seen that before. So then you just need to educate them on why it's not the best choice for them and the more full service. And, you know, as in any type of industry, there's, um, you know, Ponderosa and there's Capital Grill and they both right, serve right. steak. So, yeah. And I think that the the one thing and we'll talk about this a little bit more in this perceived value little chat we're going to have but in the world of photography i think it's a little bit different because when you're talking about name brands like cars or Mm -hmm. hotels or something like that i think these organizations sometimes spend millions of dollars on their marketing so there's this awareness to Mm -hmm. people whether they really want to know this or not all right mercedes is expensive they kind of understand that You know, but in the realm of photography, I think a lot of people, unless they're kind of explained otherwise, just think there's no, everybody's the same. Yeah, commodity. There's no 
way really that they're like they when and that's why shopping by price is you know like i don't put there's a whole nother conversation I, I don't put pricing on my website and stuff like that but people just see numbers and all they're doing is comparing numbers whereas nobody ever in their lifetime would walk into a hyundai dealer and a mercedes dealer and go oh well your cars are ninety seven thousand down the street they're only 37 if you want me to buy this car you're going to give it to me for that 37 or i'm, I'm going down you know that mm-hmm. would be something or the person you would look at them like they were crazy but that's what happens i think in in the photography universe all the time just because there isn't that large brand identity it's more single operators and people may not know there's different products and different things going on so i think their mind automatically goes to that level lowest common denominator cd for 35 bucks maybe because uncle joey did that and back in the day and that's what they know you know when i look at the, you know and i know this isn't going to go anywhere but I'm, I'm telling that woman you know like i don't think i've had a cd in like eight years or nine years is the last time i've even i don't even think i have a cd on my computer <laughs> cd I, I, you know i don't mean to like insult the woman but i knew nothing was going to happen but yeah. i'm like yeah I, I haven't dealt with cds in a decade lady uh, you know, probably not the the best person <laughs> for you so when you know, when somebody is starting, it always seems, not always, you know, but, and, and you mentioned too, I think we were starting about the same time, mm-hmm. 2008-ish, 2009-ish, and it wasn't like today where you go online and every third person or every second person in the world of photography is some kind of trainer or an educator. Um, you kind of had to figure it out like on your own. I don't think you had those type of resources and that PPA was probably a real smart thing to to direct yourself towards because they, they got you set straight there and mm-hmm. you're really taught you some things otherwise and people figured it out or they or they didn't yeah along the way. yeah so. or all of a sudden they realized why am i working like 50 hours a week and wait i've made fifteen thousand yeah. dollars this year <laughs> yeah and and th- and that's something too that you would think you would come to terms with that really really fast mm-hmm. not like three years later and you're still doing this and this is something and i mentioned this on a, on a, on a previous show that I, I i started to do this for a blog post uh, we got interrupted by the virus but what i did was I had took a job timer like Toggle or one of these websites. And every time from the first email I would track mm-hmm. and I did it over about four or five different clients, you know, and I had done this years ago just for this purpose to see. Yeah. Like, and I had forgotten what it was. And you'd be surprised, you know, 15, 18 hours or more mm-hmm. per person, you know, all this editing from beginning yeah. to end. You're right. And then when you sit down. And you look at your 45 bucks and you've been working 18 hours and you're like, like in uh, Napoleon Dynamite, that's like $1.25 an hour. <laughs> right. You know, it's, it does not compute. It, it, right. And, and you need to like smack people senseless uh, or straight sometimes yeah. to, and, and, but that for some reason doesn't click on, on people for, for, for people as well. And so today maybe we're going to talk a little bit about how to stop this. Mm-hmm. And for and, and it's not for everybody. And you'll agree with me. And, you know, we're, your area is the pet photography business. But I think a lot of the stuff we're talking about today is, is more universal. You do not necessarily have to be a super high end photographer to make money. Yeah, you, I think you would agree with I me. I agree. There. And in the pet photography world, as far as pricing and business is very similar to any portrait any portrait genre. Um, And truly, there are ways to have a low cost business be profitable. So like, I'm not saying that you can't have a a lower end high volume, but you need to make sure that your time is set because like you look at like school photography or sports photography, where it's like, high volume, boom, 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 those can be very profitable, but you're not spending 18 hours a client. So knowing that time and knowing that profit and dividing the two is such an important calculation to make sure that, you know, we're, we're not just doing this as a hobby, which is fine if you want to be, do it as a hobby, but if you want to run it as a business, you want to try to run it as an actual profitable business. Yeah. And that's the the great thing, I think, with the photography business. It could be a side gig. Mm-hmm. You could just be doing it once in a while to get some money for some gear. It could be part time. It could be full time, you know, and it, and it fits nicely into the, all those scenarios. And I'm guessing and I don't know this, but when someone comes to you or, or starts going into one of your classes, usually the first thing is, all right, what's going on here and how much money do you want to make or how, how do you want to structure this? Because you really can't go mm-hmm. past. You can't even proceed unless you know do you need to pay your bills? You got a mortgage, right. car payment, rent, whatever yeah. it is, because you ain't going to do it giving a CD for somebody for 35 bucks. That's yeah. The that, first thing I do when helping someone with their pricing, it's figuring out 
what what their goals are, what they want to make, how much their business costs to run and how many hours they're going to work. Uh, you know, they want to work per week and therefore how many clients they could take. And then you do all this math together and out pops the magical target session average where it's like, this is what I need to try to make per session. And spoiler alert, it's almost always over a thousand dollars, usually between fifteen hundred and two thousand generally for people that want to have 50 to 75 sessions a year and have a full-time income. Yeah, it just makes sense. And I'm, I'm guessing in your experience too, that may vary on where you are in the country too. You know, here in the wonderful Northeast, the most expensive place in, in the universe, it may, you may have to charge more. You could be somewhere in, in the middle of this country or could yep. have lower. But generally, I think that's a super smart way to do it is, all right, how much do I need to, to live? Yep. And then that's a real eye opener. And again, you're, you're not going to do it giving someone 30 bucks. Nope. You're, you're right. <laughs> you got to come up with Unless this number. Unless you're shooting like 100 kids in one day and it's boom, boom, oh, boom, boom, boom. School you'd lose your mind in a, in, in, a, <laughs> um, in a week and a half. Yeah. But th- that is something I saw on, on one of your, I forget it was on one of your shows or, or somewhere where that's one of the, 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 the biggest things that you, one of the questions you get is how do I know how to charge? Right. You know what I'm what I'm worth, and again, people don't even know where to mm-hmm, where to start. Um, where to start? Yeah. So, like, what are some of your tips, or how do you approach someone? How do you, you know, get them started in, in the right direction there? Well, yeah, like I said, just like figuring out what it is, what what our goals are, because we need to come up with that target session average, um, because we just need to know. Then, once we know, okay, my goal is to make fifteen hundred dollars per session, then you can start to look at your pricing and say, how can I build this price list in a way that encourages everyone to spend fifteen hundred dollars? Um, one of the things, because Oh, I like to say there's an art and a science to pricing. So there's the science with the numbers of like, here's the hours I need to work. Here's long, how long it takes to do to serve as a client. Here's, you know, how much I need to make per session. And then there's the art to pricing, which is what does this price list look like? What do I have on my price list? Do I have collections? Do I have bonus schedules? You know, where things like a digital file or all the digital files become less expensive, the more products they buy or a certain price point, they can get them complimentary. There are so many different ways to do this. Um, But it's really important to look at that and say, all right, like how have I set this up that I'm encouraging people to do what I want them to do? One of my favorite things, because what's the one product that we want to make sure that like pretty much is never the only product that they buy, right? That that one single eight by 10, (laughs) because if they come to a session and buy a single eight by 10, unless you're charging a thousand dollars for it. Um, you're going to be losing money on that session. So instead of, you know, saying, uh, you know, maybe I don't sell eight by tens or like having it on there and worrying that people are like, oh, see, I'll just do that. I don't even put a single eight by 10 on my product guide. I have a collection of five, like $500. If you want to buy five, eight by tens. Okay. We can start talking. Um, And of course, if a client comes and they buy a beautiful wall piece and they want to have an eight by 10 for their desk, sure. You know, just, you don't have to advertise all those little things. So all of the conversation that you're having with your client on your website and during your inquiry process and, um, you know, when you're talking to them and your emails, talk about what it is you do and how you're different and how you serve them, which is often tangible, beautiful products that are going to last a lifetime. Um, because digital files, even if your work's completely different than everyone else are still so much of a commodity, they don't understand why those digital files are $35 and yours are 3000. They just, it doesn't compute where when you start to say, here's this beautiful, you know, floating framed acrylic from Germany. And, you know, they're like, Oh, you know, they start to understand why that might cost more or even prints when you, get prints and all of my prints. I don't, a floppy print never leaves my studio. They're all mounted on styrene with the linen texture, UV protection. So I can say, these are my, you know, fine art prints that, you know, have a a linen or that, that plastic backing, styrene backing. I don't call it plastic, even though it is something more Um, tangible. Yeah. And it's, you know, yeah. And you're explaining the benefit. So you're like, I have this, the, the styrene backing. So it doesn't bend. It doesn't warp. I have the UV coating. So it won't fade, you know? So you're telling them this is basically why it costs more. And they're like, Oh, okay. Then they don't compare it to Costco because it's a different product. Yeah. And that's, that's important too. And, you know, once, 
these people kind of start to, and I think at some point, if they're going to make, they connect the dots and you get that aha mm-hmm. moment, like you're right, no, this, this isn't going to work. But then I think it goes to that other extreme, maybe where $1,500 a person and they, I would never do that. So they assume nobody mm-hmm. else would, would do that, which is a whole, another whole discussion. But if people do, I think, start to get a little bit of this together and they're, and they're doing some work and they're, they're starting their business. The other, I think, giant mistake, and you're dead on with this, and you mentioned this in, in one of your episode, episodes too, is the first they, they want to go online, see what photographer X is charging, see what mm-hmm. photographer over here is charging. Well, they're charging this, so I must charge the same thing or $10, like less. Mm-hmm. There is this sort of drive to see what everybody else is doing and do the exact same thing, which is probably, and you would back me up here, the exact opposite mm-hmm. Or at best, really bad way to to proceed from that point. Yeah. Well, please explain why. Oh my gosh, you have no idea if they're profitable or not. No idea. And same thing goes to you guys. Did you look at other photographers' social media and they're posting stuff? And um, you know, this happened to me when I was starting. And I'm pretty sure it happens to just about everybody you, that you are, um, you know, new to your business and your calendar's not full yet. And you look at other people and you're like, Oh, look, they're posting all the time. Oh, they must be, have a totally full calendar. Oh, Oh, they are full. Oh, their prices are this. So because they're busy and their prices are this, that's what I need to do. But you don't realize they're working their tail to the bone and they just like they have no money left over they're working like 80 hours a week they're up all night editing trying to deliver these images you have no idea what the quality of life is on the other side of that business so that's why it's so important to figure out what your numbers need to be and learn from you know other other instructors teachers resources that teach you best practices to make sure that your cost of goods sold are coming in at 25 percent or less which is what ppa recommends as they've looked at so many studios to see what's profitable um so there's just oh gosh there's just so many moving parts and it's so easy to let your brain just um see other things going on and trick you into think think that's the right way. way. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's the thing. And, and and people see that, but you don't know if that person, right. You said profitable. They could be a nut job. Mm -hmm. They could be not booking any people. They could just be showing images they've shot for a long time saying they're booking people. You have no idea. No idea. You don't know what, like you said, they may not have a, any uh, any business costs. You know, they may not have a, like a, or maybe you're looking to rent a place and they don't, there's, there's nowhere really to compare. Like it's not a price comparative thing in, in that, in that in that way i think you really that's a mistake you got to start with yourself like you said and what you want to make yeah and for more or less it's not but kind of even ignore that Mm -hmm. because in the end it really doesn't matter yeah no i think it it, it just it's not really it doesn't matter and i think that weighs a lot of people down they get stuck in this well if this person's charging 300 i'm gonna only charge 200 yeah you know and and, for something that you said too that made me think of of an important point is when you were saying, oh, well, I would never spend $1,500 um, for this. We're not our target client. Um, and I want everybody that's listening the, to this right now to think of something that you really value. So for me, it's vacations. Unfortunately, in 2020, haven't had many of those. But in an unusual year, I love vacations. I love going to nice restaurants. I will spend money on those two things. I will never, ever spend more than $100 on a pair of shoes. I will never spend more than $20 on a purse. Like, no chance. You would never see me with one of those $3,000 bags or, you know, $2,000 pair of shoes. I don't care how much money I had. So I am obviously not the proper client for like Louis Vuitton. I am the proper client for a fancy resort. Um, So same thing with our, our business. There are clients out there that value what we do. And there are also clients that will value what they do, what we do if we explain what we do. There's others, like that person you talk to with the CD, that don't. So that's fine. We explain what we do. They're going to go away. They're going to hire someone else. There's nothing we could do about that. And right. that's we not should your just person let them go. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But I also want you guys to think about a time when maybe you had an experience that you ended up spending more money than you originally planned. 
and you were really excited about it. So for me, one experience I can remember is when I invested in um, professional branding. So I had been in business for about five years. I had like DIY'd my branding before. So I invested in a professional to do this. And a lot of the costs were coming in 2,500, 3,500, somewhere in that ballpark. Well, the company that I fell in love with was almost twice that much. Um, And I couldn't wait to spend my money with them. And I look at it and I'm like, what did they do? Their messaging was totally different. They owned who they were. They didn't try to fit in and say, I've been a photographer since I was a kid and I've always loved picking up a camera. No, they were fun. They I just like, they probably, some people read their website and were like, oh, these people are not for me. But people like me were like, oh my God, you are my people. I need to hire you. So just think of a time where that happened, because if you own who you are and who, what you offer and your personality and your business, you are going to attract people like I did to them, um, to your business that are, they're not going to care what it costs because they just have to hire you because they love everything you stand for. Yeah. And that, and that's a, like I said, I think people put a lot of their prejudices, their own prejudices, Mm -hmm that can impact them in terms of pricing. Um, and maybe until they really see that somebody else is doing this too. And then that, you know, they're, Oh yeah, no, it can be done. I understand Mm -hmm. that they're stuck in, in that, you know, that it's like almost like a self-defeating cycle. Yeah. Cause then you get no people and you want to charge less and you want to charge less and want to charge Mm -hmm. less. And it just kind of, it goes, it goes down, it goes down from there. And when you're, and I heard you mention this before, and I do want to relate this a little bit to what you do in 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 the in the pet business. I'm guessing you said more. There are strat. Mm-hmm. There's high, medium, and and lower. And it really doesn't matter. I don't think what somebody picks as long as they do it properly. Mm-hmm. Now, would you say if you are now is the pet business? Would you say now that's still something that's still growing? Oh yeah. There's still opportunity there yeah. for 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 people. Yeah. What are how do you what's your thoughts on on that as far as how it's developing? Yeah, the pet industry in general. I don't know the exact how many billions are spent in the pet industry, but it continues to climb exponentially each year um, in the U.S. and worldwide. And so many more households are forgoing having children or waiting until they're older to have children. So there's a lot more people that have their dogs as their their basically, you know, furry child. Um, So, yeah, so it's just absolutely expanding. And I love this perspective on it, too, because, uh, you know, 10 years ago, there was maybe one or two pet photographers in a city. Maybe. Now there's certainly a handful, sometimes many more in the bigger areas. But if you look at it like this, so many people think, oh, my gosh, there's too much competition now. It's going to be so hard. But um, how many dogs are around your city? A lot. There's no way you can photograph them all, number one. Number two, how many people do you say, I'm a pet photographer, and they say, what, really? So when a large number of people have that response, that means there's still a lot of people that need to know that we exist. So that means for every new pet photographer in the market, that is more awareness marketing for the general public to be like, oh, pet photography is a thing. And then they go online and they start to look and they try to find their person, you know, the person that they connect with and that's who they're going to hire. So even if they learn of pet photography from someone else, usually they're still going to do a little Google search and see what's available in their market. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. There's so much opportunity there. And I encourage everyone to look at that as, you know, it's not saturating the market. It's just educating the market. So there's still there's still time mm-hmm. and there's still for, for people to get into this. And when someone comes to you, do you really get involved w- with the part and direct them? Yeah, you. it seems like you should be one of these low, higher volume, mm-hmm. lower price people. Is, is there anything that would lead you to believe that somebody like if they don't really have editing skills or if they don't want to get down and do really like sit in, in Photoshop and yeah. create masterpieces, they're better off doing, or maybe for some reason they're in a city and they can, they can survive doing $50 shoots and do 10 of them in a day. Would you direct someone mm-hmm. to that or do you leave them to make up their no, own mind? I leave them to that? make up their own mind. I would say for someone to thrive, I've never really done, um, high volume, low cost. So, um, you know, I might not be the best to speak on that, but it would definitely be someone that um, enjoys 
new, 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 busy, 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 work, 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 mm-hmm. and really loves the shooting and and wants to create. Basically, it's it's like almost a production line. You're going to be creating a lot of the same thing. Um, whereas what drives me is creating a beautiful art piece. Um, so that requires a little bit more time and they're always different. And I love working with my clients and, and creating something special for them, you know, that comes down with the consultation before, um, even if they book the session before a consultation, like we always have the consultation before the session and it covers much more than where are we meeting and what time are we going to be there? It's talking about what are we what are we creating? Because I'm going to shoot for an album completely different than one big wall piece. Where in your home do you want to hang this wall piece? Is it vertical? Is it, you know, a uh, horizontal space? Do you want a gallery? Do you want one big image? Do you want a family image of you and your dog or you, your husband and your dog? Do you want just the dog? Um, are you not sure? We want to maybe have both of those options. What does your home look like? Are we thinking like a rustic barnwood frame? Do you want a more modern acrylic? Because all of those things go into my decisions of what I want to shoot and where we want to shoot and what this end product looks like. So that's where my passion is. Um, right. And yeah. which is individual, de- yeah, more detailed, which is definitely customer a, service a more, approach, yeah. more high end option because of the time needed for it. Um, but yeah, it, it can be profitable, be lower, lower or more high volume. It can be profitable if you did an all inclusive. Uh, I had a, a friend, she was a family photographer, but she had all inclusive digital package. She rocked it. I mean, she knew what she was shooting. It was, but it was like $1,500 It's more now. That was gosh, like almost eight years ago. So it's probably over $2,000 now, but it's Um, she had this whole set of people that trusted her. They knew her, they started as newborns, they went through families, they, and she had a rockin' business. Um, so you can definitely set it up however you choose. It's just so important to know those numbers and to keep track of your time. Cause that's the big X factor that people tend to forget about. And it would seem to me too, uh, that if you, that higher volume, situation too probably isn't suited to an individual operator yeah as well because if you're based on volume that seems like to me you'd want to have like one of these team mm-hmm. things where you hire a bunch of high school kids or something and send them all out and then you're you're churning in in, a, in in that way because how many possible photo shoots can you i guess if you book them a couple in a day you can do it but that seemed that would be draining <laughs> yeah like after like two weeks you'd be like what am i uh-huh am I? be exhausted <laughs> and just for for reference we're talking about low end stuff here, but in the world of pet photography, I know you can still have four thousand, five thousand oh, yeah. dollar clients, and 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 probably up. Mm-hmm. And I think too, it comes down to a little bit of: Would you rather have one four thousand mm-hmm. dollar person or like ten one hundred dollars yeah. or twenty? You know, right. and th- that what's going to drive you crazy or not, or how busy you want to be. Now, when people would you think in 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 the business too, it's it you can start to transition. Like, would you tell somebody, all right, start low? Because like anything else, you're probably not going to be a genius photographer right. at first. Right. Now, the one thing that happens in like women's portrait photography, and you know, this it became very popular for whatever reason, like five six years ago. Uh, I don't know exactly why, but there were throngs of people who suddenly became aware of this. And what happened was, you know, it is Debbie's at home and she had this cupcake business and no one wanted to buy her kale strawberry cupcakes. So she became very disenfranchised and she took a picture on her iPhone and uploaded it to Facebook and whatever friends were. Oh, my God, Debbie, that's a right, great you picture. Be a you should be a photographer. <laughs> oh, my God. And she's like, you think? So she stole this, sold the stand mixer she bought and she was very angry because no one would buy her cupcakes. And she goes on Amazon and, and buys a camera. And suddenly she's a, a pro boudoir mm-hmm. photographer now, you know, never having touched a camera in her life. Right. But having a website now and a camera makes her, you know, like a pro. Yep. And as long as she is there changing lives, you know, the narrative right. is more important than than what you're doing in in pet photography. Is, is there such a narrative like you're, you know, people get into it for the wrong reasons or that people just suddenly decide to I've, they, they meet someone like you and wow, I'm going to do that. And and they're really jumping into it before they really have any skills or how, what is the learning curve do you think involved to work with to work with pets? So yeah, I think the learning curve really is similar to any any photography 
genre because you're learning the photography and then you're learning to manage the animals. So just like if you're going to be a newborn photographer, you need to learn the photography and then you need to learn the special skills for posing newborns and things like that. So we all have our, um, like for boudoir, you need to know how to pose people flattering, like, you know, all, all these things, all these special little, um, little, uh, tidbits that you just need to know for each specific niche. Um, Oh gosh, I forget. What was the beginning part of that? So I started to go so off on a when, tangent. That's all right. <laughs> need, need some more Pepsi or yeah. need some, need something else, or maybe something else. And it is Friday. When people are jumping into like I was, yeah, we can't drink. We, we'll have the drunk photography podcast. When people are getting into oh, yeah. pet photography, I was saying like the miscues in boudoir photography are really this false narrative that they're changing lives, which seems to be more important than actually knowing what you're doing. So in pet photography, do you find a lot of people getting into it for the wrong reasons or a lot of people really, again, buying that camera saying, I'm a pro yeah. now before they really have a lot of training gotcha. behind yeah, yeah, yeah. doing what they're doing? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely a specific things you need to know for e any, any niche that you're going to be in. Um, as far as pet photography, I don't think there's wrong reasons per se, unless you think, oh, the pet photography is growing. I'm going to jump in there because there's opportunity, but I don't really like dogs that much. Um, not a good reason. Like you have to love these animals um, or there is no way that you are going to have the patience to do with this. And your clients are going to see through you in a second because your clients love their animals. Um, That's the most important. Yeah. Yeah. Being in their, mm -hmm. yeah, and, in their and lives. And they can tell. They can sniff out a non-dog person from a mile away. Now, that doesn't mean you need to be like, you know, have your own dog. I actually didn't get a dog until four years ago. So the first six years of my business, I was the only pet photographer on the planet. Well, there are a few of no, us, no. but You're very not busy. many of us very, had a dog. I had a cat. Very busy. <laughs> um, but it's, it's important that you, yeah, that you really enjoy working with the animals and Super important that you will spend the time to learn about the natural history of these animals and what their body language means, because it's our responsibility when we're photographing these dogs to make sure everyone's safe. It's our responsibility to be stewards for these dogs because, you know, the owner and any like, you know, like a mom at a family photography session, they're stressed to the max. They're like, Junior, you better cooperate. Thinking the same thing with their dog, like better sit um, or they think, oh, it's okay. He's okay off leash because they think, oh, well, if I want a picture without a leash, I need to have him off the leash. Meanwhile, 90% of the images I've taken, the dog was on leash. On a leash. So they have these, oh no, he's fine. He's fine. Like we have to be able to know behavior enough to be like, that dog's not listening to her. Hey, we're going to put him back on leash and then we'll take that out and post. Um, so just being able to things like that. And when dogs start to get a little uncomfortable, especially especially if you are a family photographer that wants to photograph dogs too, because that's a stressful situation for everyone. Those dogs are picking up on mom's stress, kids' stress, your stress, like the kids. They're not sure yeah, what's going on. The kids yeah, like yeah. crawling all over the dog and the dog's like, I'm in a new situation. Everyone's stressed. What's going on? Like you just don't want anyone to get bit. So you can start to see these little warning signs in the dog of like licking their lips or their ears going back or a little bit of hair standing up on the back of their neck or just like a little tiny quiver in their lip tail between their legs like these really subtle signs that they I'm will yeah they will start to exhibit before you know the situation goes bad so um and to a lesser degree when it's just you know you and the dog owner and there's no kids involved you know if you want this beautiful picture of this dog up on this kind of like wall or something but the dog's not comfortable jumping up there on your bench and there's like some Can't holes and yeah. you know and you're taking a picture and the dog's like heads down and their shoulders and their ears are down like it's uncomfortable. Yeah. You could tell. The, and the yeah, owner's yeah, not yeah. going to want that photo. And, mm. you know, so it's, it's important just to be aware of that so that you can make sure it's the best experience for the dog and the personality of the dog is happy and, um, you know, excited when it, when it comes through in the pictures. Yeah. I'm guessing that's something you can't learn in a, in an ebook. No, well, you know, there it, are, it, but it yes, does, but it's also 
Yeah, you can learn in a book to know what to look for, but it takes practice with actual real live animals. <laughs> right, time and experience. Mm-hmm. Are there are, and I would guess I don't I don't know this. Are you know like are there interns or you know like a wedding? They'll have second shooters mm-hmm. to get involved. Is are there people who do have like someone come along, or are there or is that not how Sometimes, it's done? Sometimes, especially if you're um, photographing with any sort of um, artificial lighting, I find it's mm-hmm. really challenging to use light stands because the dogs are moving so much. So I much prefer human light stands that are because yeah, they. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> that I just say, keep it right here on my head. Like wherever I go, just it moves with me. Um, it sounds like you need some drama. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, so there are opportunities. I mean, you could also probably um, uh, intern with a, a dog trainer, things like that. Um, there's a lot of dog training material online, dog behavior material, YouTube videos online that you can seek out that information for as well. Another, this may be a strange question, but still related. Now, in your experience, I'm, I'm guessing if I contacted you and I said, hey, yeah, my, I want to do some pictures with my dog, how, how much do you ask about the, the yeah. pet and its behavior? Or are there certain dogs that you would say, yeah, that's not really my thing. I don't work with this particular species. Cause, and you, you may not say it to the yeah. person, but they're known to have issues or they're known not to be the best for photos. Is that like a, a reality of, of dealing with certain type of pets? Um, well, so yeah, so certain breeds do have certain tendencies, tendencies, tendencies. Oh my gosh, I can't say that word. Anyway, um, certain breeds have certain characteristics, <laughs> um, but I would never label that whole breed as, you know, aggressive or bad or challenging. Um, and I do ask questions on, so I have a questionnaire the client fills out, and then I also go over it kind of verbally when we're on um our pre-session consultation, I ask about how nervous the dog is, if the dog's nervous or if the dog's really confident in new situations, um, if they have any triggers that make them a little anxious, like bikes or other dogs, new people. Um, and then we kind of choose our location accordingly. So like my dog's super reactive. I could not take my dog to a Some dogs are just city. very hyper. Yeah. And when they, around people, they're, right, right, right. they're very excited. They're never going to sit yeah. still. Oh, we've or got some, some dogs may be that. <laughs> or aggressive. Yeah. You know, some dogs may be because you don't want to go out somewhere and the dog's just like bouncing off the walls because, you know, it's right. just. Well, though, for the for the hyper ones, they're usually pretty easy to um, start calm to down. Kind of calm down. I'll keep a leash on them the whole time. They're still in one spot. We have lots of novel noises. They're like, oh, what's that? Um, for a dog that might have an aggressive tendency, I'll still photograph it, but I will be very careful and I'll probably just use a long lens. Like I'm not going to come up and do a wide angle lens, like over top the dog of the dog looking up because that's going to be the next block yeah. with like a 500 millimeter yeah. lens. That's right, going to be very, good. very nerve wracking for that dog. Um, and then there's, you know, always some breed characteristics, like for instance, photographing mm-hmm. greyhounds or sight hounds. Um, a lot of dogs noises are like my key for getting good expression, but sight hounds are so visually driven that usually you can do a noise, one noise, one time, and they get their ears up and then they're like, Nope, I don't care what noise you pull out of your bag. No chance. So you have to like start throwing things and having someone run or like bring a squirrel out of your bag or something. (laughs) So So there's certain breeds that are more challenging. Is is it, is it really like a lot of setup beforehand or is it often you show up at a location and you're doing the photos or is it usually a bunch of calming down and, and getting everybody used to use before you even start to take out totally your camera depends. first? Or you... Totally depends. So mm. my general workflow, kind of when I get to the new location, I've already had the conversations with the parent, but I get to the location and I meet the dog and, you know, I'm not going to come up and be like, oh, it's a dog because the dog might be like, holy cow. Right. So that, that seems like the last yeah. thing. Yeah. So I meet the client and I just kind of ignore the dog for a minute, keep an eye on the dog. If the dog's interested in me, I'll make a reach my hand down, let him sniff and maybe like then squat down, give him a little pet. Um, I'll pull out my camera. I'll just hold my camera to my side and press the shutter and make sure there's like, so we'll catch you yeah, right, no big yeah. deal. And then, um, you know, we have some treats if need be, if the dog needs to walk around and like sniff that. around and like settle down for where he is, we can do that. We can take a break. Um, so yeah, it's just really just keeping an eye on their behavior. And again, knowing, case knowing case, that body language way. and that behavior and, and just working yeah. from there. Now this this is a sad kind of a question too, but I'm I'm curious here. Do you ever and this is like awful, but like when you're get a call mm-hmm. from somebody or some you know, their pets are maybe like terminally ill 
or you know there isn't isn't much more time with this particular dog and they may even be very ambulatory is that a situation that you may have to deal with too mm-hmm. or have you gotten calls mm-hmm. where you know it fido only has a couple weeks left can you help me yeah. out and, and how do you work with a situation it's actually like that? fairly common unfortunately because oh really oh really? yeah one of the challenges with pet photography is there's no timeline so there's, you know, high school, senior, you're graduating, a wedding, there's a wedding date, a newborn, right. they're born. Like they have a specific time that you hire this photographer. Pet photography, it's like, oh, next week, I'll do that next week. And then all of a sudden the dog is, you know, it's yeah, late, has a yeah. terminal issue. So a lot of times people do call um, because their dog is, you know, has a limited time. And for those cases, um, I'm, most of us in the industry try to like basically drop everything to try to get a that dog a session in. To accommodate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then some people have like special, you know, special packages for it because, um, you know, you're not necessarily going to put a giant wall piece of your dying dog on your wall. Um, so maybe the sessions, you know, and they're smaller and shorter sessions because the dog's not as active anymore. Um, so maybe it's just like a little image box with five images or something in it that yeah because that you just build a little yeah, something special. I was just always curious, but it's interesting to hear that that's actually... Mm-hmm. a a part of that industry so i guess that can really be it could be sad yeah i'm guessing it is um you just have to look at it from like what a gift you're giving to the owner you know that that without Mm. you doing this they're not going to have any images of their you know their favorite dog what all right well i won't talk about anything more i know i'm like you're gonna make me cry I know. I'm sorry. All right. So we'll, we're actually going to get back on the track. We like diverted off of our our notes here. Um, and what we're going to talk a little bit about here, no more dying, no more, no more pets. Um, <laughs> no more, no more. With people who are getting involved and in, in running their, their, their pet photography business and say they do want to go ahead and bring this business more upscale. And a lot of people do that mm-hmm. wrong. And this is where I, so, and I'm like, yeah. This is 100% right, what your notes were on this. And the number one thing I think, all right, I'm going to be high end, but yet I'm going to say that in name only, but there's really nothing else about your business Mm -hmm. to back this up. So this is a very common Mm -hmm. problem, isn't it? It is. It is. Yeah. I mean, think about any high end experience, whether it's, um, you know, Apple computer or Tiffany's piece of jewelry or a really nice steakhouse or, you know, um, high-end shopping like whatever it is think about the high-end experience for think of cars like think about going to a bmw dealership versus a hyundai dealership and you're taking your car in for service and they'll come pick you up and all this you know they give me a yeah, free they'll car give you a foot rub while your car's getting uh you know serviced um you know so when you have a photography business that started off you know more high volume just you know not not building around that value and then all of a sudden they just jack up their prices the rest of the experience needs to match that. So that starts with your website. It better be, you know, clean, easy to navigate and speak to the value of what you offer. It's, it's not enough to have just some pretty pictures. Um, it definitely needs to look like it was built uh, in the last five years and not like, you know, hold over website from 1998 because that will immediately right. turn people off. And even when, even when, you know, Jane talked to her friend, Sarah and Sarah said, oh my gosh, I just got photos done from this photographer. It was so amazing. She's still going to go to the website and check you out, even though it was a referral. So the website is 100% critical. And then what's the process after that? So they get in touch with you. How do they get in touch with you? Can they call you if they want to call you? Do you have where you're located on there? What happens if they email you? How long does it take to get back to you? What does that look like? Um, Could it be something like, you know, is it a video message? Do you call them? Do you just email them like a generic price list? What does that experience or work? Yeah. 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 Like what does that experience look like and how can you make it feel exclusive and how can you serve your client? If you put yourself in your client's shoes and you're like, Oh my gosh. Okay. If I wanted to have this service, what do I want? Like they want information quickly and easily and they need education about it too. And so you need to talk to what makes you different from all the shoot and burners? Like you have to speak to why your prices are what they are. And I don't mean saying um, my prices are what they are because this is what photography costs and blah, 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 blah. Like it's not from a, 
Um, I need to prove something to you. It's just from a, hey, these are the from benefits. These are the benefits yeah. of choosing to invest in your artwork. That you have, you know, archival products on your wall. Um, you know, I like to say, yes, I do sell digital files, but most of my clients choose to add those on to their beautiful, tangible artwork um, because digital files basically can go the way of dinosaurs. Like, and I even say with a CD, I'm like, you know, think about a uh, CD. You can't even play a CD on most computers anymore. Um, you know, that, that changes so quickly. So, and I, and I go at it from my, my, what like my why basically is I want them to have these things that they will have forever. I don't want them to sit in a drawer. And that's why I do what I do. And um, this is why I choose the very best products in the industry. This is why I have a 100% satisfaction guarantee. I tell them if they're not happy with their products, I will buy them back from them. Um, and, you know, I've never had to do that because people are happy with them, but it makes them feel more secure with, oh, like she's looking out for me. Like I, I see why this costs more. Um, but it's all of those pieces working together. And by far the biggest piece of that is your uh, experience and your communication with the client. Because, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of times they just want the information and nobody will answer the phone. Um, and, you know, it depends who your target market is. If it's young professionals, maybe they're totally fine and they just want a video message and some emails and ways for you to talk. Sometimes it's hard to get yeah, people on the phone Ways now. to talk yeah. digitally with you. But if you're targeting empty nesters with their little, you know, Cavalier King Charles dog, uh, you better have your phone available because that demographic wants to pick up the phone and talk to you. Phone and talk mm -hmm. to you. Yeah, yeah. And the one thing I noticed too, you know, you'll see I'm a fine art photographer. And like right. you mentioned before, it'll be like some website decided by a third. Yeah, right, right. There. And, you know, they're like, but the, the message isn't yeah. there. And, you know, I think that that's super important. And not everybody has a ton. If you can't, not a lot of people build their own website, but it can cost you 4000 3000 to get, and I think that's so well worth it again, yeah. especially if that's what your your message is going to be. But even, yeah, even if you weren't ready to build a, you know, hire a designer to do your website, there's so many clean templates out there that you can. Yeah, if you're on WordPress yeah, or wherever that, yeah. That you can just, just put together a clean, easy to navigate website. Um, and yeah, and make sure that your work, your portfolio is cohesive, that it's not like, oh, look, I dabbled in um, sapia. Oh, and this one's black and white. And hopefully there's no selective color, you know, but like everything, oh my goodness. <laughs> everything just, you know, to have this high value experience, your website or your portfolio needs to be cohesive. It doesn't mean everything needs to be shot in the same exact style, but it needs to have a continuity. Yeah, like if you put it all out, like I used to tell my um, people for my family sessions, put the whole family's outfit on the bed. If there's a piece that's sticking out, like as if it's one big outfit and make sure it looks nice together. <laughs> like mm. same thing with your portfolio, put it all up on your computer screen. And is there a piece that's like that one doesn't fit? You can still shoot it, but don't put it in your portfolio. You need to curate that so that um, people know what they're getting. And it, and I, it, the message would be like going, like you said, to a fancy restaurant and walking in and them giving you like a paper plate with like yeah, a hot dog right. on it as you're, as you know, and you're like, uh -huh. wait, like, a wait there's a white you know, tablecloth and a plastic yeah. fork. I guess in an airport that happens, but anywhere else. Yeah. <laughs> but this is people pick yeah. up on these things. Uh -huh. And if you are going to wedding, whatever your, your business is, if you're advertising yourself as this high end type of person and you're giving somebody a hot dog on a, on a, mm -hmm. on a paper plate, there, there's discontinuity there, and the and they start to you know, and they start to question things. And when people get a little confused, they're more often to say no, or, or you're you're not likely, I think, to win them over in, in that respect. But people fail, even if they get the website. I think part you're right. They forget about how am I responding promptly, or video yeah. emails, or whatever it may be, and and going right on down the line. And yeah, and you're if you are sending out price sheets and stuff like that, it can't be something you took on a you wrote down on a paper napkin and snapshotted it with right, your phone right. and emailed them. A, uh, you know, that, it, there's a whole litany of things that you have to have in order from top to bottom that sort of are going to be behind this high end type of, uh, of, a, of a pricing here. And any one of those things not being there can start to cause the person, I think, to be like, well, what am I doing here? This doesn't seem like it's justifying those um expenses in there and one of your other 
pointers you had on one of your shows is about brand alignment. And this is kind of what we're talking about here, being in line with the with the markets that they serve. And your example was like, you know, Holiday Inn Express, just because can't go and charge six, seven hundred dollars a night, you know, just because they feel like they 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 suddenly say they want to be like a boutique hotel. And it's a very similar thing with with photographers. You can't have like a third grade looking website. And I don't think start charging people four thousand bucks for their photos because it's not going Mm -hmm. to it's not going to fly in that uh, in that regard. And moving on just to one more other topic here. And we're talking about like if you are getting or thinking about going into the high end pet business, and we were talking about this a little bit before, is dealing with cheaper competition because mm-hmm. it's going to be out oh, yeah. there. And interesting that, uh, and I remember this, and you said you saw recently uh, there's companies out there even giving away free sheets yes, now. Free sheets, and, and it was and like $15 a, little, dollars a file. <laughs> like a, a, a picture. And I remember. And I don't remember where I saw this, like years and years ago, too, with someone doing this with portraits. And it wasn't like a one photographer. It was like some kind of one of these Uh Uber type things, but for photographers. And and you did this and someone, I don't know whether they showed up at your house for like 35 Uh bucks. And and I haven't seen it in like years and years and years. I questioned the, you know, was the validity or more the long term value of this. But that could be a real panicky thing. For a lot of people, is all right. I've just been talking to Nicole. She sounds like she knows what's going on. I'm, I'm going to do this. I got my website. This guy Mike says I need to know how to talk to people. I got a fancy price list and, and I, video emails. We're sending them out, and I'm, I'm ready to go. And then they're on their Instagram or something one night, and they see a little ad for free photo sessions for pets. And then they're like, oh, should I make mine free and charge $15 a photo? Or or even uh, if they don't, not asking, should I do that? They all of a sudden go to, oh, there's no way this is going to work. There's no way I can charge that. I might as well close up. Forget it. All your information was bad. Yeah. I'm shut down. I got to sell my uh, camera again and on get a new stand mixer. I'm going back to making cupcakes. <laughs> so, but the the truth of the matter is, and we've been talking about this, and this again applies not just it could be mm-hmm. baby photography, mm-hmm. pet photography, anything. That this is not a threat to anybody. So please elaborate on why, even if this is down the street yep. from you, this is not a threat. Oh my to gosh, your, there's to your so business. many reasons why, and I kind of I love this topic. Um, so number one that, well, let me start this way. There's, imagine this triangle, and you can have fast, good, and cheap. You can only have two of those three things. So you can have fast and good, you can have good and cheap, or you can have fast and cheap. So usually this, oh, I'll show up at your house, $15 a file, comes under fast and cheap. They're leaving that good market wide open. Um, So, you know, you look at this and it's just, it's not, it's, it's, they're the Ponderosa. They're not even Ponderosa. They're catering to like McDonald's value menu. They, they are not even talking to your same target client. And as far as pet photography, this would be the same for newborns and families. The, you know, generally there might be someone that they get that is decent. There's going to be zero consistency. They're going to have no idea what kind of images they're going to get. Um, they're certainly not going to know how to work with the dogs. They're not going to know, you know, or in that price point, there's not going to be any post-processing included. Um, you know, and everyone gets worried. Oh my, the phones take such good pictures now. Okay, great. But yeah, guess what? That phone can't remove the dog's leash. Um, and the phone can't print a beautiful, uh, you know, 40 inch acrylic. So there's always room in that market. Mm. There's always room in the market for excellence. Um, you know, you can look at any, any luxury, um, any luxury part of any market and there is always room for excellence. Heck, I was reading my, um, one of my travel magazines the other day and they had, I forget if it was, I think it was this one again. This is like the second time I've seen this in the past, you know, 10 years where they had different beach towels and I'm a, you know, $10 beach towel from Costco kind of girl. But uh, they had a $450 beach towel. I'm like, who in their right mind is going to spend $450 for a towel they put on the sand? Um, Someone's yeah. flexing out there. They yeah. want that towel. And, but there's somebody. There's somebody buying that towel. Mm. Um, so, yeah. So it's just not even, it's not even the same target market. And one other point. 
for this particular topic too is I noticed this a lot in family photography. Um, my last couple years doing family photography, which was, uh, gosh, like 2015 ish, um, where I was getting a lot of clients coming to me and I always ask them if they've worked with a professional photographer before on my questionnaire. And a lot of them were saying yes. And I, the next part of that question was, did you have a, you know, how was your experience? Is, is there anything that could have been improved basically? Um, oh man, the amount of people that would come to me as a full service wall art providing photographer that answered that question. Yes. I did the all inclusive cheap option and the service was terrible. The quality was terrible. It took three months to get my photos, whatever it was, there was some, some issue. Um, and now they're like, Oh, I, I'm happy to spend $2,000 now and do this mm. right. So I've started that to see that happen in the pet world now too. So, you know, people, they, they get, um, you know, maybe the first people when they first, oh, I'll hire a photographer, they get tempted by the, the fast and cheap, but they realize that they're, they're missing that good side of the triangle. Yeah, and I guess one thing too, and, and you learn this as you, as you go along, if you are going to price yourself um, on the higher part of the spectrum there too. I think one thing that may be tough for people to, to, to be able to deal with as first is you're going to get a lot mm-hmm. of no's mm-hmm. um, as first. Now, I don't know, are you an advocate of, of putting a lot of pricing out on your website or no? Or do you really have to do that, that consult first? Yeah. Because this is a very hot no, I, topic. People well, are on both is, sides this of, of this. interesting you bring but. this up because in the past I have always said – um, that I'd basically do a starting at, like most clients spend at least $500 on their portrait mm. experience. Um, or I might show some products and have a starting at price, but I never had full pricing. Now I, and I have not tested this. So nobody take this as gospel because I have not tested it, but my, I actually want to test that this year and switch up my website and put not all of my pricing, but at least some it's like, all like there. all inclusive packages and include a wall piece. Um, because I am looking at it from a consumer point of view, and I, I like to ask myself every once in a while, like, what are the pain points for my potential clients? And I recently refinanced my mortgage, and holy cow, the biggest pain point ever was you can't get a straight answer for what things cost. Like, I just want to call and make and be right. like, Assuming I have good credit, like what's the best rate you could give me? I know you can't guarantee that rate because you need to like do my credit check and all that stuff. But like, what's your best rate? No one will tell you. You have to like do the call and go on a 25 minute call with them. And, you know, and it's just like when you're process, when you're yeah. trying to price check a couple things. Yeah. Answer, and I you know that's yeah. a commodity, but I feel like there is. Um, I think there is opportunity there for us to serve our potential clients better to give them an idea more so than it just starts here or it goes from X to X. Um, so anyway, I'm going to test that out. Like I said, it's just a theory. It's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's an, it's, it's an interesting thing. And, and the reason why I was asking you just because, you know, if you're yeah. high end, you know, either you're going to get a lot of no's whether you see them or not because if you list pricing yeah. starting at 2000 3000 if people see that next um and then you know if you don't list anything and they contact you and you know yeah. you know Nicole where generally my clients are spending about 1800 usually in the low end here to here you know and they're you know a lot of people aren't going to say right to you oh, right. that's too much for me they're going to be thank yeah. you we're going to get back to you I got to check with my husband but i think <laughs> right yeah i got to <laughs> talk to someone else um, and then there's a whole like, well, if he wasn't involved, yeah, how do you feel about, you know, there's a whole way yeah. to go down and do that kind of a thing. But you're just going to get more of those no's, yeah. I think, because your 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 market is going to be fewer people there. So I think that may be something that a lot of people have a tough time dealing with or they feel they're they're missing right. out. But wait, if you don't want to spend two thousand. Yeah, right. Wait, then wait, they wait, start wait, don't, willing, don't go. <laughs> yeah. You know, and there's a there's a lot of psychology that goes on mm-hmm. there and i think part of it comes down to maybe what suits yeah. you but you know it's one of those and i've done it both ways and half full half one way and and you put prices on there and, and you could draw but you don't want to mislead anybody either saying it's lower and then oh look at this now i got to pay right. for this 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 and this and i kind of settled on a system first of all you were talking about message i think where your your website mm-hmm. has to give that impression all right this is something that's a little fancier putting luxury on there or whatever that may be and the quality of your images and stuff like that so you got to start people off maybe put, put in some text but one interesting thing, and I've done it, you know, in both ways, is that having the, the pricing on there 
if you're committing to a price, say, even if you're putting a range, you may run into some people that said, hmm, well, I would have paid, he's putting this as a thousand, I would have paid 2000 for this. So now I'm getting, a, I'm, I'm getting a, of a deal. You know, there's other people who say, putting a thousand on that you're going to turn a, right. away a lot of people and, or, or getting them involved in the process. And then they're going to feel very awkward knowing that they can't, they can't pay that money. So I guess it depends on which side of the coin do you see that is that opportunity where you're going to be missing out on people who wanted to have paid more, or you're really worried that you're going to hurt, you know, the feelings of people. And as weird as it sounds, I chose not to have yeah. pricing on my website and I, uh, what I did in my case was I on my contact form, I have a couple of weird things on my contact form, like how excited are you? But one of the things I have on there is kind of like they do in weddings and stuff like what is your budget? And I don't have any mm-hmm. numbers. I don't have any, yeah, 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 right. you know, 500. It's just that number. And I think what that does is when somebody fills that in, it gives up a lot of information oh, yeah. to me to know where their brain is. And if somebody does put in like $300 or something yeah. like that, you know, I know that's not my person, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's oh, all they're willing yeah. to spend. It may be that they mm-hmm. don't know what they're, they're looking around and seeing that. So that becomes the challenge. But like if you said, if someone fills in, oh, I'm getting married, I want a fan, and they put $2,500 in there, you know, then you're right. All right. So now I, I know where, where they're going to be. So I think it comes down to the individual. I'm very happy to do it in that way. And I get plenty of people filling out my website. I got one the other day that put like a hundred dollars right, right, in right. there. I'm getting married a yeah. hundred dollars. And then I wonder if they're, they're serious or, not or, or not, <laughs> but you know, but see, I have another knock. See, this is like bad stuff. I have a knock yeah. question on my thing too, where it says like, how excited uh-huh. are you? See, this is bad. Don't ever do this at home. <laughs> anybody, what I'm about to just tell you. And it says, you know, like how excited yeah. you to work with me. And I, and if anybody's not like a nine or a 10, yeah. I don't even contact. <laughs> You're like, here's the form, literally. Man. And I get people. <laughs> Just this week, I got one woman who put a five yeah. in there. Like, why would you go That's through all funny. this stuff? Yeah. Pick a five. She also put a real low yeah. amount in there. And this is bad because I'm good with my people. But I know, you know I don't even, because I don't have the, I don't yeah, have the time right. and I'm so busy. I don't. But I think going back to that, that um, budget part of it, it's an interesting yeah. experiment yeah. Um, to, to, to see what works best for you. Because you're right. You, I think a, a little bit, as we were talking about before, you people may put their prejudices Mm -hmm. on there because you know you don't like to go through that just like we were talking about before where Mm -hmm. no one's going to pay that you know to to get that budget out of people because you don't like it but i found that it really shifts the power to me in a matter of speaking of knowing where that that person is sitting and then i can approach that person whether i send them a little video note oh hey mary you know i see you put three but you know we're usually in this range and i'll be happy to explain to you why and and people and i think it has to do what we were talking about earlier too and and that in the world of photography unlike big brands people may not necessarily understand you know mercedes is they don't know they're going to pay more they don't necessarily understand that and i and seeing pricing out of context i think isn't super helpful because i always assume i'm not the only person that Somebody's right, looking right. at, you know, they're probably looking at 10 other people. And if this person's five, 600 and you're 2,800, you know, these numbers don't right. mean anything like right. you mentioned, because they don't know what they're getting for that yeah. wall art and, and a super fancy album. All they see are these numbers. So any thoughts on yeah. that or, or, no, or for sure. what and, would you, you think? know, I would never put, I, I would never put all of my pricing up there, but like I am toying with creating a couple basically like um, collections. So like, yeah, the wall art collection, like, you know, like we want, we're going to, our goal for the session is to create a beautiful wall piece. And it starts at this, you know, it starts at 550 and includes like a little, I don't know, 11 by 14 or something that they could upgrade. You know, I need to figure out what, what exactly it is, but it's just like basically, or, or an album option, you know, just so they have an idea of, Oh, look, that includes those things. Um, or, you know, or a custom, like a, you know, oh, you really want something often that we can create a p- perfectly custom something for you. So it's still just floating around in my head. So it's not for and public consumption yet. It, <laughs> no, that's right. It's yeah. working through. But it's an interesting thing because once you yeah. have done so much of this, you start to see these patterns and, and so forth and what you're doing. And I also think, and this is just me, but when you're working, again, yeah. weddings, whatever it is, in that higher end, I think that 
allows you to be more custom mm-hmm. to. I don't think you need a price list that oh, is no, written exactly. in stone. And you can't go, oh, no, this is this package. This pa- You have to live by one of these packages because, you know, the people are spending and you would say to that person, OK, you know, I understand. And then you can ad- mm-hmm. you can you have the liberty to adjust these things to do something maybe that's going to suit yeah. them a, a little bit a little bit better. You know, and then, you know, you can adjust. Well, you may say, oh, well, you, you into this important. Well, that, that portrait wouldn't work for you. It's a good thing that we did this. And here's what you really may work best in your situation and, and adapting that and that pricing, which is a lot more work. And I think the one thing that a lot of people overlook in the world of photography, and, and I know you don't like to use this word, is, is sales. Um, they're talking about being salesy or so forth. But I think there's ways to communicate with people that it oh, doesn't absolutely. come across salesy. <laughs> Um, and, and trusting and, and being honest and genuine yeah, you're, it's a with service. people. You're but, providing a service. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and that happens in the mm-hmm. onboarding part of it too, you know, to get yep. them to come in to see you. But also, I think afterwards, mm-hmm. when you're sitting down, and I know you mentioned too, you're a little bit of IPS, and we're, we're having like a great time talking here today, but... <laughs> Go on all day. And this is only one Pepsi. <laughs> Imagine if I had a, on an empty stomach. But when it comes to... The IPS, or you call it IPC, um, I guess because oh, yeah, you know, right. want to think of sales as kind of a, yeah. uh, you know, how do, how do you work with that as far as, as making it a personal thing? See, I can't really, I do that, but in my case, m- my people come from yeah. all over the place. I have people from, God, I have a New York, so there's, I can't bring yeah. people in and like sit them down because it's way too far away. But I guess you could do it remotely. Yeah, I've done some Zoom before, um, especially this year. But I'll talk a little bit about how important this is. And, oh, critical. Yeah. You know, and this could be related yeah. to this pricing thing, because this is where you can sit down to somebody and say, Jane, all right, what, you're, you're, I don't really want to say, all right, I'll tell you what I'll do. And you can really be a little bit more yeah. adaptable to people and, and help them out a little bit more. In that yeah. Way. So, so my, what are your my thoughts most on that? important inquiry question, um, which ties these two together really well, is um, how... What do you, how do you want to display your images? Um, that is the question I ask all the time. Um, because that, like your budget one, that gives me, that's my secret question that gives me like a preview of what they're thinking. So what were you thinking of doing with your images? Oh, just some digital files. Okay. We have a conversation to have. Oh, I want to get something, you know, from the living room. Great. I know what conversation we, where we start. Um, so yeah, so always talking about that and like, we basically decide, you know, they're not committed to purchase what they're going to purchase, but we've already talked about it at our consultation that we've talked about what we want to create in the session. So we've already basically talked about what they intend on buying. So by the time we sit down to go over our images, I know exactly what they want that we go through. I show them a slideshow. We choose their favorites and I say, all right, well, you already sent me the wall for your living room. Here's this. Here's some of the ones I was thinking of, but this was your favorite here. Let's pop this one in here. Here's the different finishes that I have. You know, I think this will look beautiful in your home. What, what are you drawn to? And we just basically design that piece that we've been talking about, um, or a gallery, or if it's an album, whatever it is, I usually design wall art first. I'd say that's my most popular things. What almost everyone gets. Is that what portrait, Mm -hmm. like wall art is you think the biggest thing? That's what, at least for mine, but that's what I love and that's what I Mm. speak to. So you, you um, preferences. Yeah. Yeah. So that tends to be my biggest seller. I know some people that really speak to albums and love the album. So that's what they sell most of. So it really can be whatever it is that you love and you educate people on the value of. Um, but yeah, so we design the wall art and then I show them my album samples and tell them that many of my clients choose to do an album or uh, an image box of some of their other favorites. Um, so they may or may not add those. And then the last thing is if they wanted to add the digitals and or prints. And it's really, that's easy. Like, I don't have a gazillion items on my price list. I Yeah, I it's, probably, it's wall art, albums, or image boxes, and prints and digital files. And yeah, People put way yeah. too much crap on there. But see, this, again, is part of your service mm-hmm. process in taking people through this. Because what I think, there's so many photographers that leave so much yeah. money at the on the table at this point. Because they're like... 
like handing the person the menu. Yeah. Just let and me know if, what you want. They don't, and, and people don't know. online gallery that I did that, they're going to get a couple five by sevens or eight by tens because that's what they know. No one's given them permission to do a 40 by 60 above their couch. Like no way would they ever order that without them seeing mine when they come into my sales room, which is my dining room um, set up as a sales office. Uh, I have a 40 by 60 of my daughter and her horse on the wall. Like they come in and like that is stunning. You can have it in your right. house too. And they don't know that something right. like that exists. And then people are like, wow, and I need that. And then the 30 by 40 looks that too. tiny. <laughs> Next to, I need, as, a, as a canvas, they it's make them acrylic. that big or no? The framed or, acrylic is oh, beautiful. Oh, oh. I had to put like three um, uh, anchors on the wall though because it's super heavy. Uh, probably, <laughs> <laughs> right into the studs. Boom, boom, boom. Metal yeah. rivets going into the, <laughs> you have to put metal studs and like reinforce But it's your, beautiful. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and that's that's such a mistake and with people leaving money behind and I think part of that too is is feeling maybe they're being a little bit pushy or they don't want to force people into into doing that and, and it, you have to gain that comfort into talking with these people again it's not right. necessarily pushing things on on people but making them aware and just saying oh Judy this is the perfect yeah. you know wall piece and, for for this yeah and I and, just tell people to change their perspective you're not selling don't call it a sales session you just want to help them enjoy their images so it's just about showing the images and helping them figure out how they're going to get the most enjoyment out of them like you know never is my intention to be like huh how can i pad this sale i mean it's you know of course i want my bottom line to be good but my intention is to make sure that they love their images and to help steer them to the ways that are going to fit their home the best and bring them the most enjoyment and you'll even uh, make arrangements for these items to be installed oh yeah yeah, sometimes yeah Mm -hmm. especially if it's going to be a 40 by 60 acrylic (laughs) yeah just get a little hammer here you go yeah well, I think we like talked about a lot yeah, of stuff. Yeah, I mean, here. there's just so um, much stuff. It's so fun. It's a great conversation. We could just go on and on, I know, there. And it's, and it, it, listening to, it's just one of the things I think that people get a lot of value from. And I think the bottom line in a lot of this stuff is there isn't necessarily one right, right way when it comes to like displaying pricing or what you do or low price, high price, medium price. I mean, you have to run your business in a certain way, I think, to be successful and deal with your clients in a certain way. And ultimately, I think it's like playing the guitar or anything else. You find your way, you find your style, you find what works best for you and and your personality. And I don't know, maybe if you're not so great with dealing people in front and doing sales, you figure out some other way to do it on online or video but, I do have um, a friend that nobody. does just online and is just pre-set up packages and she's really successful too. So, you know, like you really can do it just about any way, but you need to do it with intention. You need to know why you're doing it that way. And you need to mm. make sure that there's not something you're missing that's going to bite you in the butt. Right. Like your time. Right. And and also, the realization here is people have to understand in, in the pet business or whatever business that they're not going to make a living selling people $35 CDs, you know, and then there's another whole world there. And it's, it's so important, I think now, and this, this really didn't exist, like when we were mm-hmm. getting started 2006, seven, in that time, where you can, you offer your services to somebody, and whatever that price is, it's so well worth it, because you can accelerate somebody four or five years ahead of where they would have been figuring this out on their own and, and how much money they could have earned. And, you know, it, it's such a, it's such a benefit to people. So after all this great information that we gave away, what I want you to do is just take a few minutes to talk about the hair of the dog Academy and what you do there and now how people can sure absolutely you. thanks yeah um we're at hair of the dog and we also have a podcast the hair of the dog podcast which you can find links to all the stuff on the main website and um tons of free content on hair of the dog but for those of you that uh, are committed to building a profitable pet photography business or committed to really improving your craft hair of the dog academy is a membership site with Oh my goodness, we have so many um, courses related to shooting, post-processing, marketing, pricing. We have guest instructors, so some of the leading pet photographers in the industry are also teaching inside the academy. Um, Office hours, one-to-one laser coaching sessions, um, critique corners where you get your work critiqued, Facebook group, like 
all sorts of incredible content in there. So definitely check that out. Um, for you extra special listeners of this podcast, um, yeah, got something free a special for trial. Um, it's not quite free, but it's a dollar. So I think we can all manage All right, that. well, there you go. Um, yeah, seven-day trial to the Academy for only a dollar. Um, so you can check that out. Ooh, I love the sound of that. We got it, boys. <laughs> you can check that out at hairofthedogacademy.com slash trial. Outstanding. And then on your show, your podcast, which I'm creeping around. I'm listening yeah. to you <laughs> all the time. Yeah, I'm listening. <laughs> And really, your content, like I mentioned before, is really just some of the smartest content. And as I mentioned, you remind me a lot of me in this no nonsense, you know, yeah. kind of, it's not going to work. You got to do it like this. And it's very informative, very smart, and very straight to the point with a lot of, not a lot yeah. of, eh, you know, some people, and I always mention in uh, talking about this with somebody before, and I, I hate to keep repeating myself, but uh, I, I, when I'm working at night, often I will have mm -hmm. like a podcast on. It's not always photography, yeah. listen to other stuff. And, and one night I was just doing a search and came across someone that was giving tips for the certain type of photography, how to start and my super yeah. important tips. And I happened to, to, to listen and it was on in the background and I'm like stopping and I'm listening and I'm like, what the hell is, it, it was just like, you know, the peanuts were yeah, something yeah, like, yeah, the yeah. Teacher <laughs> going, wah, wah, wah. that's all it was. It was just like, wah, 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 wah. it was like, it was non-advice. It was just, so, and I was trying to find out about this person and look, they have no evidence of them ever being yeah. involved in anything what they were talking about. And you could tell this person like didn't know really it would, they were just reading information yeah, and regurgitating right. it. Like they read something from a business guru and they're like you do. one of these hustle, hustle people, you know, they're hustle, <laughs> we're grinding and we're hustling. And I'm like, this is like non-advice, but your show is just the opposite of that. It is just like dense information. Um, and again, it's not just for pet people. I found it's a lot of smart content in there and you have good guests on your show that can really broaden uh, the knowledge of, of tons yeah. of, of people. And so the, the podcast is the same name. It's the Hair of the Dog yep. uh, podcast. Thank you. And uh, going on there for a while. So you're like uh, Aww, one of my new best friends now. Yay. Oh, so thanks for coming uh, on. Thanks for uh, yeah, of course. coming it was on. So fun. Glad I didn't, no, I didn't I scare talk you away. No, I could kind of stuff for and, like weeks. <laughs> yeah, me too. And that's a problem because then we I realize know, we've been wait, here now for like it really an hour, is happening. An hour and a half. And then, like I mentioned, yeah, like I haven't eaten. I had all today, I've had like a half of a pine ball. <laughs> since like seven o'clock this morning so mike is gonna go yeah, uh go eat um, and sit down for a moment and um i just want to yeah, say thanks again and then before we get i just wanted to say goodbye to everybody so we can get out of here bye everybody thanks so much for uh for hanging out with us